Good morning, church. My name is Valerie. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. Please follow along in your own Bibles or simply listen as the scriptures are read. Again, that's Matthew, chapter 9, beginning with verse 14. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Parents and guardians, children, preschool and younger, you are invited to escort your kids back of the room to join Kids Rock. And as you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. One day, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, Why don't your disciples fast like we do and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old wineskins burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins, so that both are preserved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. And at this time, parents and guardians of children, preschool, and younger, you are invited to escort your kids to Kids Rock in the back. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye. have a seat. Good morning. I really love that moment when we all sort of are collectively considering like what we might offer the Lord this week. Uh, It's a powerful moment for me personally and I just have this image of like all of our thoughts and offerings coming up to the Lord um, sort of in unison as an act of our worship this morning. So thank you for joining in with that with us. Um, My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at High Rock. It's great to see you and open God's word together and see what it has for us. As always, I want to invite us into a moment of reflection and pause before we get into that, um, the rest of the service and the rest of the sermon, uh, to be still and to know that God is God, which is not something we often pause long enough to realize. So I invite you into a moment of stillness and into silence as we prepare our hearts for what God has for us. Please join me. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word that reveals who you are to us. Um, I pray that even this morning as we open it, that we would consider ways that we can understand you in, in deeper and more powerful experiences. We, ex- we uh, pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. So the very first McDonald's was opened in 1953, and the premise to McDonald's was brilliant and simple. McDonald's would basically serve three items entirely. They served hamburgers and french fries and milkshakes. And they served them faster and at lower prices than anyone had ever seen before. And the entire store was planned down to the inch so that every single person would get their food as quickly as possible. And they would get people in and out of the restaurant as fast as they possibly could as well. It was a monument to a time-honored American value of efficiency. Efficiency. We love being efficient. Here's a happy fact for you related to efficiency. McDonald's is so committed to efficiency that they put a silicone-based polymer in their fryer oil to reduce the splashing oil as it might splash out of the the hot fryer. It's the uh, same chemical they use to treat head lice and create silly putty. How cool is that? I mean, fun fact for us this morning. It's wonderful, brilliant. All right, back to the point. The whole system is wildly profitable, right? So now there are over 37,000 McDonald's in over 100 countries, and they've expanded the menu to include chicken, fish, salad, desserts, breakfast, McRibs. Who doesn't love a McRib? McFlurries, the, the menu is just expansive, right? All right, so then another fast food place comes along that promises even more than just efficiency. McDon- Burger King comes along, and they say that not only can you have it right away efficient, but you can also have it your way. So you could customize your order with whatever combination of lettuce, pickles, onions, mayonnaise, mustard you wanted. 
BK proudly proclaimed that there were 221,000 different ways to customize your Whopper. This captures another great American value, and that is the value of choice. We love having choices. And we have so many choices, don't we? At Starbucks, you can order 87,000 different drink combinations. At grocery stores, there's an entire aisle of breakfast cereals to choose from. It's the whole length of the row of choices. How many different kinds of Oreo cookies do you think there are? I'm not even talking sizes of Oreos. I'm talking kinds, flavors of Oreo cookies. Do you know? 85, I told them this week. 85 kinds of Oreo cookies that you can get out there because sometimes you're just in the mood for key lime pie Oreos or cotton candy Oreos or buttered popcorn Oreos. Not buttered popcorn itself, right? Buttered popcorn Oreos. Sometimes you just want a buttered popcorn Oreo. Am I right? Am I right? Amen. All right, so choice is a good thing, right? But once we have more than about six choices, research shows that, like, the value of the choice actually sort of diminishes. We pick an Oreo, but then we decide, or we start to worry that there might be, like, a better Oreo out there that we could have picked instead of the one we picked. What if we never get to try that other Oreo? Having 85 choices can actually create so much anxiety in me that I don't actually enjoy the choice that I've chosen because we wonder if we actually could have chosen something else and liked it even more. And that's just Oreos. Multiply that by the 90,000 food choices we have in every single grocery store here in America. We have so many choices. And it is wonderful and it is stressful at the same time. Another characteristic of our food consumption. These choices are available to us all the time. You may not know this, but fruits and vegetables have growing seasons. Sometimes they grow in the spring, and some other vegetables grow in the summer, and others grow in the fall. And until recently, you could only get foods that were available in their season. But now you can get any food that you want any time of the year that you want it. Avocados, grapes, strawberries from around the world, year-round, no problem. Right here, available. As a result, I think very few meals or foods feel special anymore to us. We can eat whatever we want, whenever we want, so there's nothing to anticipate, nothing to make us stand back and be astonished and thankful for what we have. In America, we eat like kings. Like literally, we eat better than kings did even a hundred, few hundred years ago, right, right now today, all of us. We have so many food privileges, and it's all happened so fast that we've barely noticed. I first noticed when I was 22 years old and working at my first summer camp, and for three months at camp, all of my food choices were determined for me. No more soda, no more coffee. I had a crazy huge headache for like five days. No more chips, no more candy, no more mega burritos. It was horrible. So when I got my first 24-hour day off from camp, I drove straight to the nearest McDonald's to splurge, right, and ordered myself a double quarter pounder Super-sized fries, Dr. Pepper, because it's the best. And I started chowing down on my, my extra value meal. Something surprising happened. I could not eat this whole meal. I, like, couldn't eat the whole thing. I had always been able to finish an extra value meal before, but I guess my stomach got smaller at camp or something happened. I don't know. But I felt very full very fast, and I also felt really bad, <laughs> really bad too. Um, my body, like, didn't know what to do with all of these fats and sugars and oils that I had suddenly invaded unexpected all at once. I had no idea that the food I had been eating all this time had been so hard on my body. It took being immersed in a food detox environment for three months for me to see it. And those summers at camp that I spent there in my early 20s were probably the healthiest I've ever been, and it was forced upon me by the outside. All of this I say in preface to our Lenten series, Repurposed, that Luke already mentioned, making much into more. And what I've said about our food choices can be applied to other aspects of our lives as well, whether it's food or clothing, or possessions, or social media, or spending, or waste. We've become accustomed and entitled even, I think, to having unlimited choices available to us whenever we want them. And as a result, often, without even realizing it, we're consuming far more than we need, far more often than we suspect. This series is an exploration into a simpler life. It's an invitation to take the energy and attention that we would normally give to all of this excess and direct it instead towards our relationship with God. It's an invitation into, I think, also a deeper life. And the world needs deeper people in it. Amen? 
But I get even more excited when I start to consider the ways I might take all of that excess that I'm not paying so much attention to and then repurposing it to be generous to others. The idea behind repurposed is not just to cut back ourselves, but to take our much, our too much, and to get, give it and extend it to make it more for someone else. I'm pretty excited about this whole concept. I'm also realizing that it's probably going to be challenging at the same time that it's exciting. We've been conditioned in our world to consume things. If we have an appetite, we are told that we should satisfy that appetite. And if we need to, just get bigger stretchy pants so that we can accommodate the room, right? Choosing to say no to ourselves feels pretty strange to us. Yet that's what these spiritual practices are asking us to do, to choose to say no to ourselves at times. There's another challenge, I think, to these practices. It comes from a totally different perspective and a totally different place, and this is the challenge. We can sometimes fear spiritual practices as being legalistic because sometimes these disciplines have been misunderstood as ways to earn salvation. Like these are things we do to make God happy with us. So in an effort to cling to grace and grace alone as good Protestants, we can steer away from these practices entirely because we're afraid of them. For these reasons that I've mentioned, spiritual practices can sometimes seem intimidating or mysterious to us. But we want to talk about them so that they're less intimidating and less mysterious to us. Here at Hierarch, we have some core values. I'd like to emphasize two of them as we think about spiritual practices this morning. The first value that we have here at Hierarch that I want to highlight is the value of humility. So I encourage you this morning to have the humility to think that there are still things to learn about how to flourish as human beings and how to embody kingdom principles in this life. Humility. The second value is curiosity. We value curiosity here at Hierarch. So curiosity. I want to be curious about the things that Christians have been doing for thousands of years and explore what that might potentially have to do with me or if that might potentially be valuable for me or not. Humility, curiosity. That's the spirit in which we approach these things. So this morning, I want to talk about the spiritual practice of fasting, like fasting from food. It's an ancient practice. Moses did it. Elijah did it. Esther, David, the prophetess Anna did it. Paul fasted. Jesus himself fasted. If we're humble and if we're curious, we might discover something valuable in fasting for us as well. And to be sure, I want to make sure this is clear, this is not a way to earn salvation. This is not a way to get extra spiritual bonus credit points with God. It's not like God's going to like you more if you fast or not. My goal is not even to convince you to do this this morning. My goal is to answer a few basic questions about a practice that might feel a little bit mysterious and a little bit intimidating to us. A simple question, what is fasting? Why would we do this thing? And if we're going to do it, how do we do it? So three basic questions this morning. Disclaimer, before I get too much further this morning. I don't know that much about fasting from food, to be honest with you. Other than 30-hour famines, you guys, any 30-hour famine people? All right, so see, this is my generation, 30-hour famine. Did these in high school uh, back in the the 90s and early 2000s. Other than those sort of 30-hour fasts that I did there food-wise, it's not a practice I've engaged a lot regarding food. I've done some fasting in other areas and, and some partial fasts with food, but I haven't done like a 36-hour, 48-hour fast before. So it's uh, in the spirit of sort of a humble, curious fellow learner that I come to you this morning, not as an expert. Second, all my comments this morning are going to pertain to the spiritual aspects of fasting. All right, so some fasts are really politically and socially motivated. Their hunger strikes to try to get a message across. And those, that's great, right? And recently, even, fasting has become sort of trendy in, like, the world. Like, in the modern world, we've seen lots about fasting. And it actually has health benefits to it, right? There are, health, there are reasons for your own personal health that you would fast. But I'm not focusing on the, the social aspects or the physical aspects this morning. I'm actually focusing on the spiritual aspects of fasting because I'm a pastor, not a nutritionist. Um, I know that's shocking to you, but that's true. Okay, with all of those disclaimers out of the way, what is a fast? Like, what is it? All right, so a fast is a form of self-denial. It's when someone, for a set amount of time, decides not to eat or not to drink something. It can actually get a little bit more complicated than that. If you look through Scripture, you'll see all kinds of different kinds and lengths of fast. Just a few I'm going to highlight this morning. So first, there's a normal fast. This is a normal fast. A person abstains from all food, solid or liquid, but not water. You can drink water during your fast, usually for a short amount of time, usually in preparation for a significant event. Normal fast. Okay, there's a partial fast. This is when you decide to give up a certain food item. 
So it's meat, it's wine, it's chocolate, it's sugar, it's quarter pounders, whatever it is, for a set amount of time. So a partial fast. Then there's an absolute fast, and this is a pretty serious one. An absolute fast is when someone abstains from all food, including water, for a short, urgent period of time, usually to discern God's leading for something very specific. And then finally, there's a corporate fast. This is when a group of people all decide to fast together. The Old Testament law required one fast that all of the people would follow and observe, and it was on the Day of Atonement. And it's, we see this in Leviticus 23, 27. They called it a day to deny yourself. It's denying yourself as a community as you approach God. So this list is not exhaustive. There are other types of fasts, but I think for our purposes this morning, these are the main fasts that we see in Scripture. All right, so that's what a fast is. It's pretty straightforward. Now let's go a little bit deeper. Why do this? Like, what is the point of a fast? Like, why would a person decide to do this? It's the question that emerges in the passage that Valerie, Valerie just read for us this morning. So we're in Matthew 9. John's ba- John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus, and they say, Hey, Jesus, like, we're over here fasting pretty often, actually. And you know what? The Pharisees over there, they're fasting too. But your disciples, they are not fasting. What is the deal with that? Like, what gives? Help us understand this discrepancy. All right, so back up a few chapters. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, 6-1, Be careful not to practice your righteousness, and this is your righteous acts, like the things you do, spiritual practices. Be careful not to practice your righteous acts in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. A few verses later, Jesus hones in on fasting specifically. Verse 16, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. So this is one of the reasons why a religious person would fast in the first century. Look at me. Be impressed by my religious devotion. And this is the kind of fasting Luke talked about last week in Isaiah 58. A fast that's all about puffing yourself up and making a big show of what you're doing. Look at me. So that's one reason. Jesus is pretty clear that's not the right reason to fast, right? So Jesus says, no, don't do it that way in Matthew chapter 6. What's the right way? All right, back to chapter 9. Verse 9, 15, or chapter 9, verse 15. Jesus replies to these disciples of John. He says, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. The image Jesus uses here is that of a celebration. He's the groom, and he's here. And while he's physically present, his followers are not going to fast. They're going to feast. It's a celebration. And then he goes on to use two more illustrations. You don't sew a new patch on the old clothes, and you don't put new wine into old wineskins. They all knew that if you tried to mix something old with something new, it had the potential to ruin both of those things. What I think Jesus is getting at with these illustrations is that his arrival his appearance, his presence just changes everything. A new thing is underway. He's at the center of it. He's the Messiah, God among us, and everything needed to be reevaluated, reinterpreted in light of who Jesus is, including religious practices, including fasting. If you mix the old way with the new reality of Jesus, it's not really going to work. So historically, fasting in the Jewish world, when it wasn't about getting all that attention for how religious and awesome you were, it was connected to lament actually. It was connected to the Day of Atonement that I already mentioned. It was connected to grieving. And often fasting was a grieving over the perception that God had failed to act. God has not come through in the way we wanted him to, so we're going to fast to communicate our lament and our grief over that. So in some ways it was seen as a way to get God to listen, like to get God to pay attention, to get God to do what we wanted like make the Messiah come more quickly, perhaps. Well, Jesus did come. And what he's trying to explain in Matthew 9 is that all of the old reasons to fast are actually now obsolete. The Messiah has arrived. The year of the Lord's favor is at hand. God has acted miraculously and decisively in the world. So now that Jesus has come, his disciples' lives are not marked by waiting, and they're not marked by lamenting, and they're not marked by grieving. Their lives are characterized by joy and by hope. It's time to feast. Because Messiah has come and is here. Jesus' followers will fast, he says, but only when he's gone. And it's not a command. This is not a command to fast. It's just a statement of what will be when he leaves. But the meaning of the fast is not what it was before. You see, on this side of the resurrection, fasting is not a way to grieve or lament. On this side of the resurrection, fasting is actually associated with something totally different. It's associated with worship and associated with joy and associated with prayer. 
when you read through Acts, you start to see examples of the earliest Christians fasting, and it's connected to worship, and it's connected to prayer. So there is a place for fasting, but it was going to be a very different place and a very different reason than existed before. The fast for the Christian exists within the larger framework of joy that the kingdom of God ushers in and is present in the church. All right, so here's a summary so far of what we've learned. First, fasting is not required. There's no direct command in Scripture to fast. It's not a law. Second, the former reasons to fast, lament, and grief are no longer the current reasons, which are joy and worship. And I want to expand on that just a little bit. So in Deuteronomy 8, if you remember, we read about the Israelites. They're in the wilderness. They've been freed from captivity in Egypt, and they are hungry. They're abandoned. They're by themselves in the wilderness. And God's providing for them food to eat. In Deuteronomy 8, we read that every single morning God gave them manna, and that was to teach them that they did not live by bread alone, but they lived by every single word that came from God's mouth. That was going to be what sustained them. But they're about to go into the promised land, and their whole world is going to change. In the promised land, food is going to be abundant, and in the promised land, they're going to feast. But feasting brings with it a danger, doesn't it? Obesity. No, no, I mean, it does, but the spiritual danger of feasting is that when we have all we need, we can forget where we've come from. We can forget that we used to be slaves in Egypt. We can forget that God's rescued us. We can become so proud, so arrogant, so entitled. We have so many choices available to us whenever we want them. When every day can be a feast, it can be hard to remember that we actually need God at all. And so a fast produces in us a feeling of hunger a feeling that can remind us to praise God for saving us. A fast can therefore be an expression of gratitude. That's one reason that we might fast, as an expression of gratitude for the grace of God in sending Jesus and giving us more than we ever needed. The Pharisees fasted to get attention. Christians fast as a way to focus attention away from ourselves and towards God's provision for us. This is why fasting can actually be an act of worship. It's an expression of gratitude. It's a way to say thank you. Lord, for what you've given. That's the first, and that's actually the primary reason that a Christian would fast, I think. A second reason to fast is that it can be diagnostic for us. Every expert on fasting that I've read says something similar to this quote from Richard Foster. He wrote, more than any other single discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. Things inside of us, pride, anger, jealousy, fear, strife, will rise to the surface during fasting so that we can see them. When Megan and I moved back to Missouri in 2014, after we had the twins, we looked um, into buying a house that we nicknamed the Smoky House, the Smoky House, because their previous owners were smokers, and the house was just like thick with cigarette stench when we walked in. It actually like, gave me a headache, which explained the very attractive sale price. I did all kinds of research on if it was possible to like get out a smoky smell of from a house. And after doing a lot of extensive research, I decided that it was possible. So we purchased this house. Before moving in, I mean, I went to work in this place. I ripped out all the carpets. I took down every piece of drapery or anything that could hold a smoky smell. I spent so much time, oh, and I also sealed and repainted every surface, like every single visible surface in the house. I sealed and I repainted it. And I spent so much time on the subfloor of that house because I'd ripped out all the carpets and it was just this rough, like plywood kind of surface that I started to get all these little cuts and scrapes on my knees because I was like down on my knees like doing baseboards and stuff all over the place. But I had to just keep going because we, like, we're moving in in a few days, and so like, I needed to get this done. So after all this work and effort, I stopped long enough to really look at the damage I was doing to my knees, and I had this like, giant pus-filled lesion that I actually had to go to the hospital and treat because it was a nasty, gross infection that they had to give me like, intense medication to like, solve after like, a week of doing this work. And I kind of think fasting is like that in a way. It's a decision to slow down long enough to see ourselves in any areas of our life that might need attention. An opportunity to pause all of our fast-paced pursuits and realize the ways that those pursuits might actually be hurting us, even without us noticing. Fasting can help us stop and see the state of our souls. It can be diagnostic in that sense. It's the second reason, I think, to fast, and the secondary to the first Again, there's no New Testament law requiring us to fast. It's not a way to get God's attention. It's not a way to access special spiritual power. It's something we can choose to do in the freedom that Christ gives us. 
And it can, I think, deepen our gratitude for what God has given us. And I think it can reveal some of the ways that we're not living in the true freedom that we have in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says this. It tells us that we have the freedom to do a lot of things, but not everything is beneficial for us. Fasting seems to be one of the things that can help us see the things that have enslaved us without us even realizing it. That's the reason. That's the why you might want to do it. Okay, so final question. How does one go about doing this? As Luke mentioned in um, the opening statements, uh, our repurposed guidebook does give us some practical ideas on how to be thoughtful about the food that we consume this week. And so in those suggestions, there are suggestions about a partial fast this week. There are suggestions about a normal fast, to fast for a whole day. And if you're going to do something like that, I want to leave you with a few guardrails so that you can do this wisely and safely as you explore fasting. My first point, my first guardrail, start small, go slow. Okay, you can't run a marathon unless you've run shorter distances first. It's the same with spiritual practices. When it comes to fasting or any of the, fa- the, any of the disciplines of abstinence, so fasting or silence or solitude, start with something you can already do and then slowly increase your capacity. Foster, again, recommends starting with a 24-hour fast as like the first sort of step into it. And he suggests noon to noon the next day and that your intake would just be water from that 24-hour period of time. And he says, uh, in the process, you'd skip two meals, right? you skip dinner, and then you would skip breakfast the next morning, and then you'd eat lunch the next day. So it's two meals skipped. He says to do that about three or four weeks. And if you want, after that, you can consider extending it to 36 hours where you would miss three meals. But really, that's it. Like, that's the extent of what he sort of would recommend. If you feel like God's calling you to do something longer than 36 hours, it's something to pray about and something to learn about before doing. So start small, go slow. Step one. All right. Point number two. Don't call attention to your fast. Like, that's like the whole thing Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 6. We don't fast for outward show or for the admiration of others. Basically, the only people who should know that you're fasting are the people that need to know for some reason that you're fasting. And you know who those people are. So, tell them. Point number three. Remember that the purpose of this is spiritual. Uh... Fasting creates a lot of interesting reactions in our bodies, and you'll be very curious about those. You'll start to be like, oh, like, this is interesting. Like, I feel hungry, or I feel tired, or my head hurts. Things will happen to your body, and you'll be tempted to put all of your energy and curiosity into those aspects of a fast. But my encouragement is to redirect that curiosity to the spiritual aspects of what we're doing. Remember that we're doing this as an act of worship. So what is happening in your spirit? What is happening in your soul? Redirect that curiosity. And maybe even set apart the the activities of that entire day as holy and done unto the Lord to parallel the, the fast you're doing so have a spiritual component to it. And the more you practice this, the deeper your attention can go. And so pay attention to your spirit in this process and have a joyful posture about it. It's actually an act of worship. And finally, some people should not fast at all. Some people should not fast at all for medical reasons. And that is totally okay. There are many ways to worship the Lord that don't involve fasting. If you have any questions about your own capacity, I encourage you to ask your health care provider before even trying something like this. We've got to make sure that things are done safely and wisely. That's the final point. All right, so fasting is not something to do lightly or flippantly. I'm not trying to suggest that. So pray about it. Jesus was clear that our motives are really important, so uh, the motives are actually more important than the act itself. So the righteous act is not as important as the motive behind the righteous act. So make sure that your motives are correct with any spiritual practices you engage this week or any of the weeks as we continue to move throughout our sermon series on excess. No matter what choices you make this week regarding food, I do want to put in one final plug for our collective effort to make our much into more for others. So we want to collect as many non-perishable items as we can this week. I think even just going through our houses and our pantries and our storage, like we could find a lot of things that we could get rid of and use to bless someone else. We're going to give those all to Common Ground Ministries, as Luke said. Um, They've said that they are willing to accept food donations from us, and they will distribute those um, food items to those who are in need right here in our community. Common Ground does amazing work in our community in lots of different arenas, and one of them is food. So that's our mission. So come next week. I know it'll be hard to remember, so I'm sending you like a thousand emails this week. Uh, Remember to find things that are excess Um, or even purchase things and bring them next week. We'll have a box where you can see how much we can do. All right, let's pray. Dear dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for um, your presence in our lives. 
that um, you are more than we need, that you have given us yourself. Um, we can sometimes forget that. We live with such blessing, with such abundance, with such privilege in this world. Um, we very rarely will go hungry, most of us. And we thank you for that, Lord. But we also, in the midst of that provision, in the midst of that feasting, we can sometimes forget our true need. We can forget to care for our souls. We can forget what you've given us in Jesus. Lord, we pray that our whole lives are an act of worship, that for us salvation is not just forgiveness of sin, but salvation is a way of life, and that we can embrace our whole life as an act of worship, and that we can live with our lives as expressions of gratitude for you. For the food that you have given us is a food that we cannot pay for ourselves, and yet we enjoy it freely because of Christ. We pray these things in his powerful name. Amen.